Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz band leader and multi-instrumentalist Gordon Goodwin. His big fat band started in 1999. Their first concert was at his alma mater of Cal State University, Northridge, bringing in a collection of styles, swing, Latin blues, classical rock. And they just released their 2016 album, An Elusive Man. And along with this venture, he is a successful composer and arranger right out there in Tinseltown, Hollywood. Working with the likes of Ray Charles over the years, Christina Aguilera, Johnny Mathis, John Williams, Natalie Cole, and his good friend Quincy Jones. He has conducted world-renowned symphony orchestras in Atlanta, Dallas, Utah, Seattle, Toronto, and London. He's won a Grammy Award, three Emmy Awards, and he has great stories. So get to know Gordon and dig this interview, my friends. Gordon, thank you for taking some time out. It's it's really a pleasure to speak with you. I appreciate it. Oh, man, it's a pleasure to be on. Thank you so much, Joe. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and start off here. You know, you're pretty good about detailing what's going on with you and the band. And, man, you're you're crazy busy. But I want, in your own words, kind of a snapshot of what's going on with your music world lately. <laughs> a snapshot? Just a snapshot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why that question is so befuddling to me. And maybe it's... <laughs> It's because I've always had so many balls in the air, uh, as it were. You know, I mean, I went, from when I first started, you know, in high school, and I was playing piano and saxophone, and then decided, then started writing. And so I had three things that I kind of had to keep going, and then got into college, and then added conducting, and then studying classical music, and um, then I got out of college, and then it became okay, now you have to learn how to use a computer and, and how to manipulate samples and how to be an engineer. And then it became, okay, now you have to learn how to, to market your music, be how to mix, mix it and master it and just everything. It's incredible the amount of uh, the range of your skill set, what it has to be. So uh, I can't remember a time that, that, I've ha- that I haven't had a day where I have, like, nothing to do, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, that's a great blessing man to have a life that way and especially to to be able to get up and do things that you you love to do so i'm not i'm not trying to evade your question because um my life is uh essentially uh a balance between writing the music that i love which would be music for the big fat band or my my new band the little fat band or other projects you know in, in that genre and also writing music that they pay me to write that actually pays real money and yeah. money that then i can use to support the big band, you know, and the other projects with a little more artistic merit. Right now, uh, things are a little bit more on the uh, artistic side of the line because I'm finishing a trumpet con- uh, concerto for James Morrison, who's like the incredible Australian trumpet player, although he plays every instrument, you know, you can find. Um, he's trombone and piano and guitar and drums and, you know, he's ridiculous. But uh, we're, we're going to be touring with a concerto uh, that I've done for him next year. We're working on a record with Patty Austin, an Ella Fitzgerald tribute record. That is, um, we just uh, did a session last week for that, and we, uh, that's going to come out in the spring. She's amazing, as you know, and uh, yeah, yeah. so that was a, that was a real, uh, you know, real pleasure to be involved with that. Uh, the Little Fat Band record just came out a couple weeks ago, so we're still kind of doing, you know, press and and uh, rolling that thing out there, and we're getting ready to go in to start recording uh, a new Big Fat Band record. As soon as I can find a day where I can get all those guys in the same room at the same time, which is not always easy. I can think of more, but I mean, that's, def- that's definitely the start. Those, that's, that's, those are on the A-list around here. Yeah, you know, and I will tell you right up front, I have an immediate amount of respect for you because I, Vince Giordano, the great Vince Giordano of the Nighthawks, came to Kansas City to premiere his film, and they documented him really well about how he had to get his band together. So when I hear about how you have to assemble – this 18-member troupe, that has to be one hell of an undertaking. It's one that I avoided for years. I mean, I've loved big bands since I was in seventh grade when I first heard Count Basie. I got out of, out of college, and I had a band for a while, but um, I wasn't convinced I knew how to do it. But just in terms of the uh, leadership part of it, can I get these guys to play the music that I, in the way that I would want? Do I know how to get a gig? How do you get an agent? How do you, you know, get people to show up? All those questions. I mean, I knew I knew that I could write the music, and I knew I could get the guys to play it. But um, it was uh, not until about 1995 or a little after that that I I started to I looked at my career and I had a bit of an epiphany where I said, you know, I, I'm working 
a lot for Disney and for Warner Brothers and, you know, doing really great projects. And it was all cool. But it had nothing to do with me. You know, it was it was me writing music that that director wanted or that producer for this project wanted. And and a lot of times I get the comment, they'd say, yeah, it's a really great cue you wrote for that. But maybe next time a little less Gordon Goodwin and a little more, you know, Carl Stalling, in that case, which was the, you know, he's the uh, Warner Brothers animation composer, legend guy that we all modeled. And so I thought, is that my thing? Is Am I, am I just supposed to emulate other people? And if, is that what I'm supposed to do with my musical life? I decided maybe not. And so that's when I started to write uh, new music, called up the guys, recorded the first record, and then just kind of all of a sudden now here I am 15 years later, and it's a you know, huge part of our, our lives. You know, I've got a manager and an agent and a booking office and a, and a couple of office managers, and um, um, it occupies at least half of my time, maybe, maybe more. But it, it could o- occupy more, but the sad truth is is that I, it, the economics still don't work. Yeah. I yeah. can't, uh, unless, short of getting a situation like Lincoln Center, you know, where they have some, some corporate support, uh, it's really difficult to put 18 guys, 20 people with crew on an airplane. It just, th- that costs what it costs. Yeah. So, and and then I have, it means, and then I have to pay the guys something. And, and, and these positions that I use are, you know, pretty in demand. And so most Absolutely. of the time when they're working with me, even if I'm paying them like 500 bucks to play a gig, which isn't bad, right? Yeah. They're probably losing money. Yeah. So so I had to learn how to how to position that for these musicians and say, look, it's worth it to lose money to play this music. Yeah. And and I think the guys that are that are that are on board, I think believe that for the most part. But I've had also to learn to be flexible because if 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 one of my guys gets a call to play the Academy Awards, right? And I'm offering 500 bucks for one gig, and he has to turn down a week's worth of work. Well, he'll make five thousand dollars. How can I ask him to do that? Right. You know, I mean, he's yeah. got a family, he's got a mortgage, he's got the you know issues we all do. So that's why the band has started to get younger. And, and yeah. it's so fascinating because I used to watch that happen when I was a kid. I'd see Buddy Rich up there on stage playing with college kids, you know. Yeah. And um, and now I'm, I'm seeing that happen in my own band where we're, we're getting. And a little bit older than college because it takes a little bit of a maturation to play this music uh, the way we do it. But um, I'm seeing that happen, and it's really great. It's really uh, uh, you know freshens things up and, and invigorates things to have like a new young guy come in and, and uh, not have all the same baggage that some of us have as we go through life and through the music business, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's get to the beginnings of your life. You, what, what was your childhood like? What albums did you listen to, and how did you get into playing instruments? Uh, the usual way. Uh, my, my mom and dad, well, they made me take piano lessons when I was in kindergarten, which I didn't want to do and didn't much enjoy. Um, but I was the kind of kid that did what mom and dad said for the most part. So I hung in there, uh, and I had a teacher that saw, I don't know how she knew this, but she saw that I had a predilection for maybe kind of making things up on the piano. So she had me write a song every week. It was a part of my assignment. And and she'd say, okay, this week write a polka. I go, what's a polka? She goes, you know, you know, she'd kind of show it to me. So I'd go home and write something like that. And then she'd go, now this week write a waltz. So every week she'd give me a new kind of style. And, and not that I was a young Mozart, because I wasn't, but it started early with me creating my own stuff. Thanks to that piano teacher, Janet Hodges. So, and this was after we, we, I was born in Wichita, but we moved to California when I was two. So I was oh, grew, okay. pretty much grew up out here in, in Los Angeles. And so, and then in fourth grade, I picked up the clarinet. And then in seventh grade, I picked up the saxophone and discovered Count Basie. And from then, it was on. I, I knew, after I heard the Basie band, I just knew that I have to do that. I don't, I don't know what that means. Write it play it I, I don't know but i knew that it sounded almost like deja vu-esque to me you know mm. when i heard count basie I, I it felt familiar in some weird way so i, th- I caught the big man virus back, right all the way back then well and then you start the big fat band in 99 you have your first gig at cal state university northridge yeah right, and, o- right. and then over the years you guys have this big huge swing just a a, a bag of styles, as you say on your website, Latin blues, classic rock. How did you evolve this band from the beginnings to now and have so many flavors that you go through? 
personally, it came about uh, as a result of going to school at Cal State Northridge because when I when I started there, I was kind of a jazz snob. You know, I didn't like pop music, didn't like classical music. I was so into jazz. But at Northridge in those days, you know, they didn't have a jazz major. I had to be a classical saxophone major, and they said, and plus, guess what? You're going to study conducting, and you're going to study orchestration, and you're going to study, you know, counterpoint and theory and music history. So they exposed me to a to you know Stravinsky and Debussy and you know Prokofiev and composers that I really revere now. At the same time, I got a call to play in a band in a club in a nightclub. So I was going to school all day and studying that stuff. Then I'd go to the nightclub and play the music of Earth, Wind, and Fire and Stevie Wonder and the Beatles and stuff. And we'd play you know till two in the morning. And I'd drive home and get home at three and sleep till by like six. And get up and go like somewhere in this I had a seven o'clock class. It was incredible that I could even <laughs> it would kill me to do that now. <laughs> but as a result, um I, I I got used to appreciating a lot of different styles kind of for for what they are. If, and so so with the big fat band, you know, we'll play a rock and kind of a rock and roll kind of song. And I don't make any pretensions that that's my, the highest level of my compositional achievement. But there's still value there in a different way in terms of groove and melody and just kind of um, uh, kind of a uh, down to earth kind of uh, accessibility. But we'll follow that with you know maybe my arrangement of Bach's two part invention in D minor that has all kinds of you know content and subtleties and nuance. You know, so I think there's room for for you know, for both of those things. Uh, and I'm lucky that I have musicians that also grew up listening to pop music as well as jazz, so they know how to turn on a dime. And if they're playing a Count Basie chart, they know that language. They know the rules of that highway. And then if we're playing something that's like Tower of Power, Earth, Wind, and Fire, they know how to articulate and phrase and commit to the music, you know, according to those rules. So, you know, the one thing that I've noticed, too, is that you've worked with Ray Charles, um, you know, Quincy Jones. Yeah. David Foster, there's a lot of people that you've worked with. What do you? What have you learned over the years about being around? I mean, just even with Quincy Jones. I mean, from the beginnings of jazz to everything that he did with you know Motown and reviving genres that were on their way out. What, what do you learn from these folks? Oh, he, well, Quincy especially was a real uh, role model because he had that exact same philosophy about not being concerned about barriers between music styles or between human beings too. And and so that's the first part of it. The second part of it with Quincy, if you go back to his big band albums, they all had a, a degree of production value that showed his uh, his interest in making sure that the music was at a high level, but so was the recording, so was the, like, every aspect of it, as opposed to I'm going to go in the club, throw up two mics and record the band, and that's jazz, baby, you know? Yeah. I, I, I really think that... Um, and we've gotten criticism from some purists about it because our records sound like a pop record. But come hear the band live. We're not using Pro Tools to fix anything, you know. These guys can play every note, every time. And uh, and so could Quincy Jones, you know, the musicians that Quincy uses. And yet they um, they still uh, came from a jazz, uh, you know, perspective and the spontaneity and all the things that we value about jazz combined with the best tools of the pop world. That's kind of what that kind of our our goal. And Quincy was a role model for me, and I told him so, man. I we got to hang out a couple times and work together a couple times, and I, I he's probably tired of me saying it to him, you know. But without him, we got nothing. So Quincy's uh, uh, Patty Austin's uh, godfather. Oh, so, okay. You know, so so every time I'm with Patty, you know, we just were there last week working on a record. I'm always trying to get new Quincy stories out of her, you know. So <laughs> right on. Yeah, I just read a really good interview with. Uh, Quincy and Ralph Gleason back in the day, and that was interesting because it was kind of around the time that Quincy was still pretty much bespeckled by the music industry and had a lot of ideologies that he wanted to follow through on. So it's interesting to see how visionary he was so early on, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, totally. So um, let me ask you this. You know, falling and the thing that strikes me about cats like you that fall into Hollywood and compose is that there's a good chance – that a lot of people on this planet have heard your work. So how did you fall in to a gig where you're composing and arranging for films, which is the most mass saturation you can get on this planet? For me, it started at Disneyland. I mean, I, I was a, out of college, and a friend of mine was playing bass there, and he says, hey, man, I think they might need a piano player. Why don't you come down and audition? And 
And I said, oh, sure, I, I like Disneyland. So I went down there and auditioned, and I was auditioned by a guy that didn't seem to know very much about music <laughs> at all. I thought that was yeah. weird. But I got the gig, <laughs> and after a year or so, I got a job writing uh, uh, for a – it was like a Mouseketeer reunion show, right? Had a lot of the original Mouseketeers like Cubby and Tommy and, you know, and, and Lonnie and those kids and um, – and I got that gig writing the charts for that show, and then little by little, I started to write more for that company. And I have to say, uh, despite uh, your, your uh, statement about the movies, the amount of people that hear, heard my music at Disneyland was – and they, they don't track it. It's hard yeah. to track, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, matter of fact, it was hard for companies like ASCAP and BMI to figure out how do we pay royalties for that. And mm-hmm. I used to go into meetings and say, look, you know. Look at the attendance for Disneyland. How many people hear this music? Because they weren't paying any royalties for live performance uh, or even for recorded performances at Disneyland. So, um, But that was kind of what led to my professional uh, relationships, that first gig. Uh, and from there, I went into working for, for television. And it's all, uh, it's all like a, a relationship at a time. I don't think I ever got this one big break it didn't never felt that way for me it always felt like a long slow incline and you know what it feels the same way now to me yeah and maybe that's maybe that's healthier for you you know to sure. just kind of go gradually up to where you're going as opposed to you know having some you know sporadic or or violent shift you know in your life or your career i i i don't know i don't know but um i will say that i've i've learned to <sighs> A life in that world for me, 100% in that time, was going to be toxic for me. I knew that. When I was, you know, and the story I told a minute ago about working at Warner Brothers in the 90s, we were winning Emmy Awards and getting paid good money, and I, I, I was feeling a little bit frustrated about it. I, I used to give myself these lectures like, what's the matter with you, man? You're conducting this great orchestra. Warner Brothers at the scoring stage, the same scoring stage they scored Gone with the Wind. It's like a dream. You're, you're, you know, working with the best musicians in the world, and and that was all true. And yet, it didn't feel like it was exactly appropriate for me to be there. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I had to kind of learn to listen to that voice. And, and I have to tell you, man, since I committed to the, to the Big Fat Band in particular. And I said, kind of said to everyone, look, this is me, this is who I am, and if you like me, that's awesome, and if you don't, then that's fine too. You know, I got to, when I got to that point, so much pressure drops off of you. Mm-hmm. I wish I would have been able to get to that point, you know, when I was in my twenties or thirties or something. I can't imagine what that, what a life in that space would be. You know, because yeah. I, I grew up thinking, okay, I'm comparing myself to Michael Brecker and to Chick Corea and to John Williams and all the people that I admired. You know, and and I think there's a fine line because I want to know how John Williams writes what he writes. How does he do that? You know, I, I'm interested. I want to strive for that. But at the same time, I do my thing and he does his thing. You know, and and um, maybe that's a maybe that message is uh, obvious to your listeners. It's a lesson a lesson that we all have to, to internalize. I think. Well, it seems to me now that you've helped, you've found a really good balance in your life. I mean, between all these things, even the first question, it's hard for you to answer because you have so many things that are varied. Does that feel good to you to have that kind of a balance? Oh, it does, man. That's I, I think I think our pursuit of balance is is uh, is preeminence everywhere. You know, in in our personal life, our balance between our family life and our work life. In music, I, I'm always trying to balance all the different elements. You know. Does this melody is there is it is a rhythm you know balanced with a melody and a harmony? Um, when you're improvising, you know you're trying to make those choices of balance in real time, which is what's you know what's really impressive the people that can do that. So um, I've become acutely aware that when I respond to music, it's because it's in, it's like has that that balance we're talking about. Yeah. Well, the one thing you did mention too is that you've, you know, you got a Grammy Award, 13 nominations, three Emmys. You have all these awards, and I don't want to know what your favorite one is. I want to know which one did you get that hit you at a particular spot in your life that really surprised you. Uh, well, the the most recent one, and 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 not that not that we're counting, but actually, incredibly, it's 20 Grammy nominations, and and I don't know how you know how how we got here, but. Yeah. We got four last uh, two years ago. We had four Grammy nominations, which was a lot, you know. And and I, I was showing my name was showing up with people like Drake and you know Adele and 
uh, for multiple nominations. And so we went to the Grammys. I had my family sitting there, and my mom, you know, and, and we're all there. The first three nominations, we went 0 for 3 in the first 10 minutes of the ceremony. And one of those I thought we had a p- pretty good shot at. It's kind of always, always hard to tell, you know, how it's going to go down. So we're sitting there, and everyone's looking at me like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And I'm going, hey, everyone, it's okay. You know, it's, it's just fun to be here. Let's just enjoy it. I'm doing that. But I had let let it go because I thought the fourth one we were not going to win. And the fourth one was the Best Large Ensemble. And um, that, I'm not going to say, it kind of typically goes to a different kind of band than ours, put it that way. And and they called our name, and I had to transition from, you know, it's an honor to be nominated, and, you know, that's, let's just not worry about it, to, oh, my God, they called my, called our name. <laughs> and and that Grammy was for the, for our record, Life in the Bubble, which was the musicians, the engineers, you know, the art direction. I mean, everybody that contributed to that. So, I mean, the other Grammys I've won have been for arrangements, and, and that, I, I'm great, I'm fine with it. But this one was just us from the ground up. It wasn't a tribute to Count Basie. It wasn't a tribute to Ella. It wasn't like based on Hurricane Katrina. With all with due respect to all those things, this is just all about the music, you know. And uh, let me elaborate on that because my first Grammy I got was for uh, The Incredibles, the, mu- the movie Incredibles. And it was, it was really great and a surprise, but I thought, well, everyone loves The Incredibles. So I kind of felt like that movie did a lot of heavy lifting, you know. Mm-hmm. The next Grammy was for an arrangement I did of Rhapsody in Blue. Everybody loves Rhapsody in Blue. It's, you know, an epic, you know, perennial piece of music by the best composer we've ever com- created in this country. So I gave a lot of that credit to Gershwin, you know. And then the, ne- the third Grammy was for this arrangement of On Green Dolphin Street, another jazz classic that everybody, you know, reveres. So, but this one for Life in the Bubble was just like it, it, we, we weren't piggybacking on top of anybody else's celebrity, you know. So that... It's a long-winded way of answering your question about which one meant the most. No, that's cool. That's totally cool. I uh, the the one thing that I wanted I want to know too is you know I, I kind of asked up front, but I'm curious who would you consider your music or jazz heroes? Well, that's another long list. The people I've already mentioned so far are probably in the top five, which would be Chick Corea, Michael Brecker, John Williams. Uh, but then I kind of cascade into Cannonball and Bill Evans. And then I start to think about uh, jazz heroes, you said, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and Ka- the Count Basie band uh, was – and Thad Jones. I mean, here you go. You know, everyone triggers like another name. Um, but uh, I've I've made a practice, uh, and I've, I kind of advise the students that I work with, that, you know, you have to listen to everything and everybody, even if you don't like them initially. Hang in there, listen to them, try to get an understanding of, of what's going on there. You know, I didn't really much like Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra the first time I heard it, you know, but then once I studied it and kind of got familiar with it, uh, it started to resonate with me. And I think you know, there are some artists that first time through, you're not gonna, it's, it's not going to land. You're going to have to take a little time. First time I heard Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, I thought, man, these guys are out of tune. What a sloppy yeah. band. What is that, you know? And then as I listened to the record, I heard, I could hear the times that they, they were out of tune, and I heard the times where they were sloppy, but I also heard a lot of the good things that were going on, you know? And, I, and it took two or three listens to, you know, to get there, so. So let me ask you this. If you could get into a time machine and whittle this list down, of all these people that you've admired that you would consider heroes, and you could punch in the coordinates, where are you going to go? Who do you want to see? So here's what I'd do first. I'd go back to... First, I'd go back to 1963 to the Grassy Knoll, and I'd find out what the hell happened there. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? I'd do that first. And then yeah. maybe I'd skip ahead a year or two and go to Vegas, and I'd go to, to watch Sinatra at the Sands with Count Basie. Mm, so yeah. I could kind of catch those two events, like, right, you know, within the same, within the same decade. Yeah. Um, I think I'd love to go back and just be a fly on the wall for uh, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. And this is a record wow. that still – we are all competing with. It's always, you know, within number one, number two in iTunes. I mean, this is, it's an incredible phenomenon, mm. that record, you know. So, um, and then after that, I think I probably would want to go, I might want to go back to uh, Paris in 19, is it 1913, the premiere of uh, The Ride of Spring. Yeah. I'd love to check that out. Oh, you know, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear what, a, what an orchestra sounded like in Mozart's time. What do those instruments sound like? Oh, yeah. You know, they probably, they probably sounded different to, to you know than than the modern instrument d- does to us. I wonder if they were out of tune, or if they were were they really soft, or what, what was that like? Um, uh, maybe that maybe uh, there's some historians that that know 
a little more information about that than I do. But I think that'd be that'd be fascinating. I will say this: I think about music back in the, in in uh, those days and how much how magical it must have been for those people because they don't hear music like we do all day. Yeah. They don't. They can't pick up their iPhone and hit any hear any music that they want the touch of a of a button. To hear music, they had to make an investment. They had to get go into town and hear a string quartet or something, or they had to learn how to play music themselves. I think that effort uh, must have must have made the experience of hearing music just you know transitionary or something. I mean, I I, uh, I really think that we take take music for granted now because of its easy availability. Hell, when we grew up, at least on a record, you had to have make the effort of taking the the arm of the of the needle and put it down at which track you wanted to hear. You know. Yeah, so, and then you, you you read the album and looked at the art. Yeah, there was a lot that yeah. went into it. It was an experience. Okay, it's sounding like old guys now. Sorry about that. Yeah, but. I know it's good. It, and vinyl's coming back. In fact. I don't have a lot of real solid memories of vinyl growing up, but I got a really cool turntable about four years ago, and I'm in love with it because I appreciate the honey golden sound of that analog coming through the speakers. It's beautiful. Oh, you know? incredible. And, you know, we lost our um, our turntable in an earthquake uh, about 20 years ago, and I never replaced it. Ah, I don't, you know, we're, we're all into CDs now. And, yeah. and then recently we bought one of those USB turntables, and I got the records out of storage and started to play them, and I can't believe we ever got away from that sound. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it really is. It, it really is. is. It, it's good. So, of all of the people that you've played for, you played for a lot of people, what's one of the nicest things that a fan has ever said to you? Uh, okay, I have, yeah, I have the answer to that um, without question. And um, essentially, uh, it's, it was a, an email I got from a woman, and she and her email said something like, uh, Dear Gordon, we really, really love your, your music, and we wanted to tell you about our son, Jesse, and Jesse, um, who we just lost to cancer. And he had cancer when he was six for the first time, and he kept, it kept, he would fight it, and, you know, back, and then it would come back. And so he's battling cancer his whole life, essentially. So when he gets in uh, middle school, he starts to play the saxophone, and he discovers the big fat band, and he loves it. It just really works for him, and he, he was obsessive about it, apparently, like, on his head, you listen to it on his headphones all day. When he's going to, going to sleep at night, it was on his. You know, he would use it in his, his, his alarm clock, and he, it was. He was always listening to the Big Fat Band. And I guess I met this kid. He came to a gig, and I met him. I took a picture with him, which they sent to me, but I didn't know he was sick at the time. And so um, she said that, and when he was going to get his chemotherapy, it was hard because he would get it, each time he would go for chemo. It was cumulatively more difficult, you know, because it just starts to. You know, your body starts to break down under that. So he would take, and, and he would get more scared, you know, to have to go to get that treatment. So he would take his headphones and put the music and listen to the big fat band for five minutes and just concentrate. And then he would take his headphones off. Okay, Mom, I'm ready. And go to get his chemo. Right. And so I'm reading this email, and, and I'm just, I, I know, I'm in tears, right? So I, I send the email to the guys in the band. I said, guys, I go, just so you know, your efforts are really reaching pe- people, like, in a real way. And so one by one, the guys in the band wrote back and said, this kid lived up in Oakland, California. They said, fly us, let's get up there. Let's play a concert for this kid's school, raise some money. And so they ended up setting up a scholarship for this kid, Jesse. We went up to Oakland. The guys donated their time and played, you know, for the school. And it's it's maybe the most meaningful thing that has ever happened to us, you know, as, as an organization. What's better than that? Yeah, no. Is a Grammy beautiful. Award better than that? I mean, so right. when when you hear stories like that, uh, I mean, certainly we've had a lot of stories from kids that you know have said the music has inspired them and to get into into the music and into jazz and everything, and that's really awesome. This is kind of on uh, another level for me, and um, uh, if if nothing else happens, you know, with this band, I mean, that that's that there's a uh, good enough reason for it to have started it up. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the one thing that always strikes me about the big band concept is that it always goes on past the founders, and it's it's always a very enduring legacy. There's a lot of examples of that in jazz. Is that your goal for the big fat band? I mean, I, it's it's very clear that you're driven enough that you're going to play music as long as your body's going to let you and your mind is around. But when it's yeah. all said and done, you leave this planet. Do you want the, the legacy? Do you want the band to continue going with younger cats? Oh man, I've never considered that. 
I suppose that uh, we've seen that happen uh, with with a number uh, of artists, you know, whose whose um, you know uh, family has kept it going. Um, Louis Belson's wife, uh, you know, she's kind of keeping his thing alive. I, I just met this kid, Paul Hefty, who's Neil Hefty's son. He's got a band playing his dad's music. Um, uh, that's so interesting. Um, I would never, I would never presume to ask my kids to do that. Um, my daughter uh, is is a, an actress and a singer. My my uh, middle son is a bass player, and my young son is a piano player. Um, they all kind of have their own goals about that. I I don't think that I uh, would presume to ask that. It's weird to think about because you know we've been doing the band for 15 years, and yet it feels like we just started. It does not. When I hear when I say that number, it doesn't really res- resonate with me in any real way. It feels like we're still just figuring out how to do it. You know, right? And and there's a lot more for us, you know, to still do. So, um, um, you know, what, whatever uh, legacy happens, I guess I don't have any control over that, and uh, won't be around to uh, you know. To benefit or worry about it in any way. Yeah, sure. Anyway, so I guess if the, other, the one thing I will say is that if if some of the music we've written uh, leaves some sort of a you know financial legacy for my kids, you know, grandkids, which I don't have yet, but anything like that, that would be great. You know, yeah. If one of these songs is able to bring in some income down the road. The other day, I got a I got a I forget the name of the band. It was kind of an electronica band, you know, and they had mm-hmm. sampled one of our songs called Hunting Wabbits, and. Um, and they wanted my permission that they could, you know, the whole song was kind of a typical electronica sound thing, but with these saxophones in there. Pretty unique, you know. And yeah. um, <laughs> it was it was pretty hilarious. I negotiated for a little higher percentage uh, yeah. on, the, on, the, on the split of the song because the saxophones really made the track sound completely different than any other electronica music I'd ever heard. But so, I, you know, I imagine the, the, the stuff will live on, uh, you know, as long as it's supposed to. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I'm a big fan of a lot of different musics, and that electronica realm is always interesting. There's an English band named uh, Lemon Jelly, and they were always really good about incorporating, you know, a Chicago tune, but they do it in such a great way. I mean, there's so many levels. It's just like what you said about Quincy. You just don't put walls up. You let that expansive array of music bleed into each other, and you're going to get magic. It's just going to happen. Yeah, you know? and you know what? I mean, I, that's kind of my hope for uh for every for human beings, I mean, our last record was called "Life in the Bubble," and it was kind of a reference to how we are tending to walk around in our own little bubbles, as it were, so that we can listen to just the same kind of music all the time. We buy something at Amazon, and it says, "Hey, here's something that sounds a lot like that." Or yeah. we can eat the same food all the time. We can listen to the same political opinions all day long. We can, you know, isolate ourselves from other people's uh, point of, points of view, and I don't think it's healthy. I don't want to be defined by my melanin content or by my gender or by my politics. You know, I I want the totality of who I am, uh, you know, to define me. And of course that takes a little more effort, you know, for so to get from some to get to know somebody who they are as opposed to saying, Oh yeah, there's a white guy from Kansas, you know. Yeah. (laughs) So um uh, and I, so I as I see that happening in music, I, I kinda hope that happens uh, you know, in our culture as a as a whole. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I got one more question for you, and I'm probably going to save the hardest for last, but, um, you know, it's kind of the brainchild of these bands and all of the orchestration and, and composing that you do. I want to ask you this. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your kids, the people that you play for, and all of business associates that, that you're involved with in, in film. But when you wake up in the morning, who are you? Who do you think you are when you face the world? Wow, you're so deep, man. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that okay. All right. That's so there there it is. Um and, and it's an issue that I've I've uh, been confronting a lot my whole life. Because you know, cause so I you know, we our kid you know, our, our kids are grown, you know, our youngest one is is uh you know, he's second year in college now, you know, so they're pretty much out. But when they were here, um I'd be like at my kids' basketball game or baseball games, and sometimes I'd have a chart there. I'd be working on a chart to get it done while I'm watching a baseball game, you know. Yeah. And and I I, I would have to say to my kids, I, I I'm not I'm watching, you know. I'm, I want I'm here, but I also have this deadline, and I felt a responsibility to both of those things. And so um, I guess what I've come around to is um, I look at who my kids have become, 
you know, as as they've transitioned from, you know, kids to, like, people, adults, you know, that you could actually have a conversation with and be friends with in a way, you know, in yeah. that way. And um, uh, as I watch that happen, that's, that's something that gives me the most pride in it. I, I try to find a way to, to express that without it seem cliched because when you put it in words, it seems mundane, you know. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, but I have to say, when I when I when I get up, I'm, I, I've always been closely identified with uh, with the work I do in the in the, the craft that I do in the, in the in the music. But I know my best music doesn't seem it seems to kind of happen to me, and and almost like uh, I, I don't feel appropriate to take credit. Like I created that, you know. It yeah. was kind of come through me in some way from somewhere and i don't know where you know i i I can't tell you you know how that happens i can tell you that i work hard in order to generate the right environment for inspiration to to strike you know i i I, i'm proud of my work ethic in that way um but um you know when i think about my kids i think that's probably the best legacy that any of us can leave leave you know leave people to take your place that are going to be responsible to our society and to our planet and uh, yeah. kids that have empathy and understanding and, and uh, act out of love instead of fear. Absolutely. That's a great way to wrap everything up. Gordon, thank you for opening up. Thank you for your music and, and all the stories, man. I appreciate it. Oh, man, really, really appreciated the uh, insightful questions. It's, it's fun to kick that stuff around sometimes. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Hollywood, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Gordon for his cool and his music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. And you can go and visit Neon Jazz on the YouTube.com and... For everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.